investors in the ATL. I want to talk to you guys about spreading out that money. This is your show. This is the show where I work for you directly, taking your needs. I'm going through the MLS, and I'm trying to find the best possible deal for you guys. Put down 25%. That's the perfect way to buy this. That's why real estate investing is the greatest industry in the world. Welcome to another episode of the MLS Search and Analysis Show. This is Holton Wise TV. I'm James Wise. I help investors like you start, build, Grow your real estate portfolios, right? But I don't just come on here and give you all some fucking fluff and fucking hugs and kisses and shit. No, I give it to you straight. I give it to you real. Now, man I'm working with today is my guy Carlos. He's an investor down in Atlanta. Now, I like the Atlanta market. Strong real estate market, blah, 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 blah. Everybody says that about their market, right? Oh, this market's strong. That market's strong. What does that even fucking mean, strong, right? Strong for who, right? Here's the deal. If you're in Atlanta right now, pricing's up. It's up everywhere, it's everywhere in America, right? But if you're somebody with like a, a really low budget, not a lot of cash, it's pretty hard to get some uh, cash flow in Atlanta right now, okay? It's hard everywhere in America, right? Real estate's at a crazy high price. Lumber's at a crazy high price. We got all kinds of people on unemployment, but we got all kinds of people trying to hire people, and they don't want the whole. A lot of stuff's crazy right now, right? So all that can make things very difficult for somebody who's trying to invest in the Atlanta market who doesn't have a lot of money, right? Uh, that's my man Carlos. Maybe that's you if you're watching Carlos's video, right? Maybe that's you. The cool thing is there are other places in America that are cheaper, right? I is the pricing in those places right now a little bit higher than it usually is in those places? Yes, but it's still lower than where you're at in Atlanta. One of those places is the Cleveland market, and I've been working with Carlos for quite a while to allow him to take his relatively modest budget and do some investing. Now, Carlos, in the last video, I talked to you at length about how I kind of wanted to uh, give you a shift, a mindset shift into the types of properties I thought you should go after. And today is another example of one of those properties, right? Super low cost, super low risk, really allow you to stretch what you do have as far as humanly possible. So let's jump into those numbers right after this commercial break. Welcome back. Let's jump right into the numbers of the property. I like this one quite a bit. 218 13th Street, Elyria, 44035. Two days on the market, $49,900, okay? First thing I want to talk about is Elyria itself, right? Uh, if you take a look, you could Google this. It's on the tools and resource section of the Holton y of HoltonWise.com, right? It's called The Ultimate Guide to Grading Cleveland Neighborhoods. When you're investing in the Cleveland market, I think it's incredibly important you know what you're getting, right? So I created this guide. Grades everything on an A to F scale, A being the least risky, F being the most risky, right? This is going to fall between B and C, right? Uh, it's like splitting hairs. I would consider Illyria uh, to be a low B, high C, uh, maybe a regular B. I don't know. I mean, th these are minute differences. It is a solid neighborhood, right? This is not what I would consider to be a high-risk investment. The single-family home, first of all, I, I consider single-family homes to be of lower risk than multifamily homes at all times, right? You're going to get longer tenancy. Typically, you're going to get more stable tenancy, okay? I consider this to be much less risky than investing in pretty much any part of the city of Cleveland itself, except for like your A-grade areas like Ohio City, Tremont, Gordon Square. But you ain't never going to see price points like 49900 over there, right? So this is a very solid low-risk investment. Works great for cash-paying tenants. Also works great for Section 8 tenants. Some people like Section 8. Some people don't. This is a nice little area where it kind of, you know, it just works out where it'll work best. Uh, it'll work out really well for either, right? In this particular property, it's priced fairly low, all right? I believe the seller's trying to create a bidding war. Now, I don't know if it'll go much higher than list price, okay? Because it is very dated, right? It's pretty dated, and we already have a tenant in there. And the tenant does not pay market rent. So for you as a buyer, that is really good because there's only two people 
that could buy a house like this. Well, it's two people that could buy a house, right? Two kinds of people. Number one, real estate investors, people like you. Real estate investors might not be that interested in this house because this house, the current tenant, is only paying seven fifty. When in fact, the market rent is eleven hundred. Okay, eleven hundred is what the market rent is. This tenant's only paying seven fifty. That's a pretty big difference, right? So that makes it less appealing to real estate investors. Second kind of person that could buy this house is an owner-occupant, somebody who wants to move into this home with their family. This is a nice area. You get a lot of owner-occupants and a lot of tents. It's a nice mix, right? Well, guess what? Owner-occupants ain't going to be interested in this because this fucking tenant lives there, right? I mean, it don't make no sense, right? So the fact that you, first of all, right away, cut your buyer pool in half, right? Owner-occupants not interested. That's great. That drives the price down. And then it gets driven down much further because a lot of real estate investors might think it's only going to rent for 750 because that's what it's currently renting for and they're missing it right they're missing the boat which is great for you because i think it allows you to pick it up at the low price because there's if there was a market rent tenant in here there'd be absolutely no reason to do something crazy like offer it for forty nine thousand. by the way that water tank that's pretty much a brand new water tank it looks like to me same deal as the furnace man this is Great stuff. Updated electrical, right? So they've listed it at forty nine nine. Now, as I talk to you today, it's uh ba 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 ba. What is it? I think it's May fifteenth, okay? May fifteenth. They are trying to create a bidding war, I believe. Because they said they will not respond to offers till May twenty fourth, right? So nine days from now is when they will make their response. So they're obviously assuming they're gonna get multiple offers. I don't think that will have to go crazy above list price or anything in nature. I think about list price should take it down. But if you want to go above and beyond the price I suggest uh, and you feel comfortable doing with that, it will definitely give you a better shot at taking the steal down because there is no scenario where there won't be multiple offers. And you need to just come with your highest and best right away, okay? They're clearly trying to, to gather all the offers. So if we, you know, just did 100 bucks over list, they're at 49.9. We just came in at 50. If we came in at 50, what you have to understand is over the long haul, you're looking at an $1,100 a month rental, $13,200 for the year. That would look like approximately 6800 coming in as a pure NOI on average, right? That's calculating for repairs, maintenance, vacancy, capex, right? Saving $1,800 a year for that stuff, right? So that's additional cash that goes into your pocket that you're not actually spending today, but you need to save it down the road, right? Like that hot water tank that was brand friggin' new, well, that's only going to last 15 years, right? So you got to pay a thousand bucks in 15 years to replace that again, right? That furnace, probably same thing. Looks pretty new, maybe one to five years old. They last about 30 years. They cost three thousand dollars, right? So you don't have to spend any money on a, uh, a furnace or a hot water tank anytime soon, but eventually that's coming. They didn't tell us anything about the roof, right? So we could assume the roof is getting towards the end of its life cycle, right? I'd imagine you're over 20 years on that roof, and roofs. Are going to be about six, seven grand, right? So there's actually a lot more money coming in, right? A lot more money coming in right now than what I've calculated as your return. But you got to know, you should really like hold that somewhere. Don't consider it like cash, right? Don't go buy a Corvette with it because eventually those big costs are going to come in, right? But all being told, you know, the performance level on this, if we had an $1,100 tenant in there, right? We're looking at 68 a year. If you bought it at 50, you only have to put down 12 and a half. Bank kicks in 37. That would be a 39.3% cash on cash return, right? Those are ridiculous numbers. Now, I'm not about fluff here. So let's be realistic. Is it possible that you can buy this at 50? Take it over. As soon as the, the month, uh, the lease, the current tenant's lease goes on month to month, right? 12 month lease, probably a few months, right? Is it possible you'd be like, hey, Mr. Tenant, you were paying $750, now you're going to pay eleven? dollars And they're like, no problem, Mr. Landlord, I'm totally cool with that, right? That's a possibility, okay? That could happen. Is it the most practical and likely scenario? Eh, probably not, right? Usually, if you take over a property and you make such a large increase immediately, uh, that can sometimes cause a tenant who was not originally planning on moving out to move out. That would create an artificial turnover. If you were to create an artificial turnover, yeah, of course, have to do a renovation, a turnover, before you can get a new tenant in there at 1100 right? This property, 
it, it, it's dated. It's packed with a bunch of stuff. I mean, it could very well easily, very, very, very easily be well above $10,000, right? So you don't want uh, to force a paying tenant out of the property faster than they need to, right? We make our money by keeping people in the properties and not turning them over, right? when we don't need to. So what I like to do in situations like this, I like to slowly work my tenants up. Will it take some time before we get to the market rent? Absolutely. But I'd rather just collect my money a little bit uh, slower than spend a bunch of money, right? I, I'd rather like a smaller stream of money come towards me than me just chuck out a big tidal wave of cash, right? So what I like to do, I like to sign them up to a brand new lease for 12 months at their existing rent. Then after that, I like to go up 50 bucks, 70 bucks. Keep it small. Just enough to keep up with things, but not enough to push them out the door and then make you push your money back into the deal. That's what I like to do. You could do it however you like, but I think that is the most profitable way to do it. Because let's face it, if we got it at 50K, even at only $750 in rent, the thing still makes cash flow, still a solid deal. It's very, very hard to find a property this cheap in a neighborhood this nice. Let me know your thoughts. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to Holton Wise TV for more financial information, education, and entertainment.